Yeah, hello everyone. Yeah, so uh, I am a, a lecturer here at NTU in the early September from uh, University of Edinburgh. My research is mostly to do with pollination and through like bumblebees, scrubbing bumblebees in general because they're a very undervalued I think, species. And we talk, when we talk about biodiversity, it's really important we look at, um, we even look at those ones that we might not necessarily agree with their life's choices, <laughs> since they have choices. Um, so many, many of us are familiar with cuckoo birds and the way that they're the best lifestyle, but fewer people are um, familiar with the cuckoo bumblebees. Um, so this, the idea of this talk really is to, to give you a bit of an idea about their lifestyle, some uh, identification features, you know, like looking to them in the summer, like spring and summer, um, and also just what we can do is try and increase the records in, in Nottinghamshire. So... Stepping back a little while, as with all pollinators, there's a, a big media frenzy now about uh, Alex, Alex talked about insect declines um, in a little bit more detail earlier on, but particularly pollinators. Pollinators are a very important uh, group of animals that uh, pollinate our crops, so, so uh, have a big, a big effect on global food security, but also the uh, uh, reproduction of, of, of many wildflowers and mosquitoes and wildlife. Um, 87, I think it's like 87% of all flowering uh, plants are pollinated by animals, and about 70% of, of all crops benefit from insect pollination or animal pollination. So they are very important to, to humans. However, we are doing our damnedest to try and kill them off. Um, we have Lots of uh, pressure, there are under, uh, quite a few pressures, the same lots of other insects, not just uh, pollinators, but you know, uh, land use changes, urbanisation, loss of habitat, um, flower rich meadows decreased, we've got something like 97% of flower rich meadows over the last century or so. Um, agricultural intensification to, grow, to feed a growing population is an issue as well, so particularly pesticide use, that's been a uh, investigation for a long time, particularly with, with pollinators, um, but also for creating these large monoculture farms to lose a lot of habitat for lots of, of, of wild species, not just pollinators. And then the climate change, which uh, is particularly in the uh, spotlight at the moment, particularly in Nottinghamshire. I, I came down from Edinburgh in September and it seemed to have rained constantly. I'll move away from scrubbing because of the warmer climate, drier, uh, and we're flooded. So, um, yeah, climate change has a big effect on these these pollinators as well. So, uh, there are some large gaps in our records about many different species, and uh, this is why cuckoo bumblebees are particularly uh, something I'd like to talk about today. So, of all the pollinators that we see, uh, bumblebees, so in the genus Bombus, are <coughs> conspicuous. We see lots of these, they're very abundant, with lots of workers, so we can see them quite often. They're, they're charismatic, big, very bumblebees. But if you ask a child to draw a bee, they usually draw some general bumblebee. Um, but most of the research that we look at focuses on the social species or the true bumblebees, which are the ones that we look nice in day to day. Less so to the cuckoo bumblebees. So until relatively recently, say relatively 30 years, 30, 40 years, the cuckoo uh, bumblebees were a separate genus city. So if you look at any you look at any older bumblebee books, it may um, describe them as citrus um, whereas we've now found that uh, with, with, with DNA testing, testing barcoding, but they're actually closely related to the main issue at all. So they now fall within the genus of bombus, the subgenus of the sickness. Um, one of the reasons why they're under, understudied, understudied and under recorded may be one, because of the negative um, connotations that come with being a parasite. No, we don't, we're not really why should we say parasite? We need to pollinate as well, add to our general biodiversity. But 
but another reason why they're under recorded is because of their, uh, their life cycle. So they, they, they don't produce a work cast, they only produce reproductive females and reproductive males. So they are a, a lot less abundant than other bomber species of workers. If we, if we look at the life, life cycle of a true or social bumblebee, so these are, in this, in this diagram, these are brown and orange color. Most of the year, or the life of the year, certainly in late autumn and winter, uh, these solitary animals are solitary, they're hibernating within the, within, within the, within the, within the small hole in the soil, Early spring, they will emerge, they will forage for um, uh, nectar and pollen, so they can provision their colony, so they will found the colony and produce its first workers. Once the queen has produced these first workers, these workers then take over the brood care of all the eggs and siblings. But they also do the forage, and these are the ones that see the blood here. So these will look after the subsequent generations within the colony. And then when it comes down to the late summer, very slightly with the species towards the late summer, we have the colony switches then to, to produce reproductive females and reproductive males. But mating will take place, and then the next year's queens will then go into hibernation, start the cycle all over again. So that's a pretty uh, there's a little bit of variability in there, but that's pretty much the same for all, for all uh, species of social or true bumblebees. In contrast, female cuckoos, and we tend not to call them queens because they don't have their own workers, they emerge from winter a lot later. So they, the reason for it is that they want the first workers to be attended to already. They will uh, usurp a nest of their particular host species. In lots of cases, they will kill the existing family's queen and take over her role as the reproductive female within that colony. But the initial host workers will carry out the care and foraging to bring up her eggs. And then later, toward the late spring and early summer, we have the same thing, similar life trait with the total bumblebees, where uh, reproductive males and reproductive females, diamonds, um, will emerge, they will mate, and they will overwinter, start the cycle all over again. The timing of this uh, nest usurpation is really important. They, uh, they really want the colony of their hopes to have enough individuals to be able to. Uh, Look after their brood, but they don't want this colony to be too big. So usually, it should be found if they, they infiltrate a nest before the second brood are uh, hatched, they usually prevail, they usually do on a day, but um, they need it a bit later, a later winter, in the, uh, not the moment from winter, um, they're successful to dips down. So they use a variety of different methods um, when they try to take over, uh, take over the nest. So some of them are Physical, so we'll see some pictures in a bit, but the cuticle is a lot thicker, they're almost like armor plated. Um, the cuckoos are, they are a lot stronger, they have stronger mandibles, uh, they have a large sting, um, so they can, they, they usually are successful with the non the colony, the host colony is relatively small. Um, if they time it wrong, the queen of the host doesn't necessarily Winning a battle, she usually win a battle. It's usually her workers that sort of surround the, the, the cooking female in the same way that honeybees surround a queen. You have seen they have queens that left the uh, left the hive, and they will try to try to sting the, uh, the, the cooking female. And they're only really um, vulnerable boys around the back of the neck, so they can sting them there and then. Obviously, it has quite an effect. Parasitism has quite an effect on uh, reproduction of the host because the host queen uh, never makes it to this reproductive stage, or if she does, it's very 
uh, it's a lot earlier, and there's been very few um, reproductive <coughs> lines or males coming out. Um, in some species, species that are queen tolerant, uh, the cuckoo will uh, live alongside cohabit with the existing queen. Um, it has, they have found uh, some uh, some studies where both of them are laying eggs, but usually she, the queen, the host queen, sort of becomes a worker. Now, cuckoos are, um, have an obligatory dependency on their hosts, which means that without finding a nest, they are unable to complete their life cycle. They've lost uh, their means and lots of adaptation to be able to bring up, found their own nest and to bring up their own meal. And one, a really good example, and this is something that's a really good point if you want to do some idea on cuckoos, is uh, corbiculus, the pollen basket. So in a true female, we have these pollen basket, shiny, smooth surface where they have press all the, the pollen that they're collecting. And you can see that near the shiny surface. Whereas the cuckoo female has lost that. She's got much uh, thinner legs and it's relatively hairy. You can see it's a bit of a crack, but you can see a little bit of the hair in the picture of uh, that. So you know, you can see. This is a really good, good feature to look for if you have a time to ID uh, with you. Uh, on the um, of course, because they are completely dependent on their host species, any of those pressures that affect their host species will also have a multiplied effect on them as well. So they're, just, they're still vulnerable to all those pressures that normal bumblebees are under, but they're also um, under the pressure of their host species population declines as well. So in the UK we have six species of cuckoo uh, and they look very similar to a lot, uh, a lot of the hosts which is why I think when we look at the records in a, a little while you see the records are relatively low and I think not necessarily that the cuckoos are not around but it's more a case of misidentification or, or um, best guess you know especially in the field without making um, uh, individuals to let us so we have these six um, bumblebees in the UK, and you'd be glad to know that records on the NBN atlas have all six in Nottinghamshire. So we have all of them here. The uh, Astalis is the most common, and then we get that down to uh, Barbatellis and Campestris, which are the, the least common. Um, if we look at the time scale at when these were recorded, a third of the records on the end of the uh, or preserved specimen um, from anywhere between, I think it's something like 1896 through to about 1935, something like that. Um, in terms of recent, recent human observations in the last part of the 20th century, uh, up until today, then 2023 is the last record that we've got. Um, we can see that there are a few a few records of them. I wouldn't look too much into the um, sort of pattern here. I don't think this is what uh, this resembles an increase in population. I think it's got more down to observer effort. If we look at these 103 records in Nottinghamshire, if we look, take a little closer look, we can see that some species are really underrepresented here. But we see since since 1986, there only seen two species of Barbatellus three or two like these These ones are relatively uh, common. The Tarvis is common throughout Europe. Rupestris is a red tailed cuckoo, so this looks very much like its host. It's very similar to its host. Um, and I think a lot of those records, I think there is more Rupestris that people have been uh, misidentified <laughs> as. Perhaps Queen uh, Lapidaris, as they tell uh, Even if we look at the year, we can see some hot particular hot spots. So, this is probably when we were all locked down. We we're going on that one of our walks. So, we could probably see more of those. But even in recent years, whether this was just a, you know, this is just a glitch where everyone was out doing a little bit more of the 
But the records are the records are sparse. The records really are sparse, which is why it's really important that if we want to if we want to monitor um, populations, population declines and shifts, perhaps uh, we need to improve these records. Um, we've got plenty of records for most of the social bumblebees, but these uh, cuckoos are, are very underrepresented in the records. So if you were going to ID some uh, bumblebees, if you wanted to look to see whether it was a cuckoo, um, the things to look for, uh, mostly the pollen basket. So here's an example of this would be nice and shiny. Here, if this is a, a true, true bumblebee, but we have this, this hair, so this is a, a really uh, telltale sign, particularly in the narrow sort of north narrow temperatures, trees as well. Uh, they're all short tom, which really mean anything unless you're sort of like taking them, but um, they have sh short boxy shaped square faces or a bit stumpy, unlike something like um Autora on the garden bumblebee where you've got long you can describe it as a horse like face it's not that really very short. <laughs> and then another telltale sign, and again this there's a lot as with all biological I imagine most of you have done lots of biological recording. You need colours and things like this. There's so much variability within the same species. But cuckoos tend to have darker wings, slightly darker wings, um, sort of a smoky colour rather than the transparent, clear wings of the true bumblebees. So these are, these are really good features to look for initially. And another, another a good way of finding out with finding uh, cuckoos is to look at these areas of Hot spot for activity. So, the mid to late spring, you'll see females trying to find nests. So, this is where they, they, they use very similar behavior to um, the queens. So, they fly in and sort of do a throw pattern trying to find nests. So, what they're using them, they're trying to pick up the odor of a host nest to be able to live in the um, July, uh, late July, so maybe in both winds or August, we see males, uh, particularly unsuccessful males, who are naturally uh, fishing as they really like. Um, so they do like um, options. So that's a good time to look for them. If you find a, what looks like a big, robust queen with a really big, beautiful flying <laughs> early spring, she's either completely this time uh, emerging from. Hibernation, or it's one of the true bumblebees. So have a look at the uh, pollen baskets. Have a look at the colour of the wings. And things. Uh, if we look at these uh, six species, so the first pair, these are group, these are white-tailed cuckoos, um, and these have yellow flashes, yellow patches. So we have a white tail. Remember, there's no workers, and you see they're a large queen size uh, cuckoo, or they're much smaller male. Similar size to the true, true male. <coughs> um, so you can see the darker wings. So this one, this is the star, this is the sun cuckoo, this is the one we've got the most records for in um, And it's not surprising we've got the most records because we've probably got quite a lot more records for the bombers to rest us than anywhere else, than any other species as well. Um, but they have some similar features to their hosts, but they don't necessarily use the same way to infiltrate the nest. There's really more possible um, similarities in them. Really, um, but, so the bomber stress is with the yellow, it's slightly muted, cross colour. And again, you've got some really dark, but it can be a little bit brighter, yellow or ginger. Um, whereas, uh, so you can see these yellow patches here. It's got that. It's very similar to, to the work of the bomber stress. So if you look for bucktail, you know, bucktail bumblebee, it's only really the queen that's got bucktail. The workers are relatively white tailed, but you might see a very thin stripe yellow there too. Particularly in the white tailed species, often you see a notch uh, within uh, their tail. So if you look where, they, where, they're, where they're at the moment, where the black hairs of their abdomen are beautiful, particularly in the best areas of the true underwear, and their tail, you can just see it, you can see it there. Have this notch, which is a nice identification. 
Bahuicus is uh, easy to trait the aggregate species or the aggregate species of Bombus Gregorum, so the white tail, the smaller white tail than the bees, but these have a more brighter yellow, so think about the white tail than the bees. Uh, Bombus Gregorum, they have like a lemony coloured yellow, which makes them relatively easier to identify or to differentiate with the rest of it. Then again, look for the uh, dusky wings. You might even find a second band of yellow hairs around here, which is not always present that very relatively. So they do have these yellow flashes of yellow satellites on the side there as well. A lot of the time with the males, um, these are not too, not too bad. This is uh, this example here, but the males are often really difficult to identify. Um, between the species, and a lot of time the women take the <coughs> reference and have a look and identify it under a microscope, which is which is interesting. Um, or the gypsy cuckoo, the, the big ones, these are even the hairy ones, these are relatively neat and tidy. Um, the style is relatively, relatively short hair, but the uh, I guess these are the long and slutty hair. So we got the second uh, group, it's still white tailed, but these don't have these flashes. We still have this little notch. Um can't really see it from the picture, it's not really good there. But um, again, we're looking these, these quite floppy, these are the earliest ones that come out. So these come out really early from the early colour. Again, a very weak yellow band, you might not be able to see it in there. Uh, something that's really obvious in the picture that's just most of the time. That their tail does tend to curl up under them, basically. Um, whether this is an adaptation for being able to infiltrate queens, sting queens, if your abdomen is pointed towards, if your skin is pointed towards, and forwards, if you're looking under the bank or something, it's happened over time. Uh, uh, the bombs cuckoo, again, these are hosts of the garden bumblebees. You can really tell they look very similar to garden bumblebees, but the garden bumblebees have a long, they've got a long tongue, they have a long face. Um, uh, Bob Tennis doesn't have a long face. But again, dusky wings, white tail, and these yellow hairs, this will make it difficult for these may be there, they may not be. So they don't make it very easy for us really to see. And then the last pair. If you, if you want to start looking for cuckoos, these are probably the easiest ones to find. Very obvious, easy to identify. Mostly black, the red, orange, and tail. So these uh, infiltrate the nests of Lapidarius, the red tailed uh, bumblebee. These are the bumblebee term, these are enormous. If you really, really, really tell you, um, if I could use it, you can see a really big red tailed bumblebee. Have a look at the pollen. You see, have a pollen. Have a look at the wings. The wings are relatively dark. And then uh, finally, the uh, campestris. So these, the main hosts of this uh, Passiorum, but they will infiltrate other cardinals as well. They will infiltrate uh, other nests. Uh, and they look very similar to you know, put them in the colouring. You've got like the ginger there, but instead of being a so because records are so poor it's really a call to, uh, a call to action really to see if we can improve that so this is one of the things that I would like to see particularly with all these Recording uh, systems that we do is actually take, take time to try and find cookies. You see lots of um, normal true bumblebees, but taking that into account, particularly around late spring and summer, when, you, uh, when the females are emerging and the males are around, try to, to uh, keep an eye out for cookies and look for bumblebees to see if they're off. Identify them by their, their obvious characteristics, so no pollen baskets, 
uh, darker wings and a, a, a robust, cuticle and strong body. Pollen aspects are really good. But it's got pollen attached to its legs. And then make sure you record any of these sightings through various uh, channels, really, just so that you can we can see these records and we can get a better picture of what is going on in in Nottinghamshire at the time. In terms of resources, the usual resources are available for helping you to identify these species. There's only six of them. Uh, Bumblebee Conservation Trust, which used to be free, but now they charge £2,000. If you remember, um, you get a drive through. So these are £2,000. Plenty of books about this. is just another one on um, Bumblebee Conservation Trust. This is about £10,000. Um, not very expensive in terms of scientific. Uh, they can do particularly guides, and Stephen Fogg is uh, probably, the, this, this is probably the best one for, for identifying bees because cookery bees, as well, um, one of the speakers said earlier on about the, uh, the book being informed immediately out of date. Uh, cookery bees haven't changed, those six species are still the same that we've been having for a long time. So, book sites are really good for it. These are a little bit more expensive. Like, um, they're all good resources. And on the subject of Stephen Fogg, um, any of his books and different sites, just a really useful, so useful resource for um, photographs of all these different um, insects. There's lots of different species of them. There's got crib sheets for identification and all these. They're all free in the day of these. Uh, you can see some really we like both because they're uh, we've got uh, lots of people that provide both of them there. We've got ambestors, even male and female. And even when you look at um, the social bumblebee, social bumblebee, he has the males, he has the reproductive females, the queens, and he also has the workers on there as well. So it's a really useful resource. And that is the end. Thank you very much.